Good morning, church. How are you guys? It's a good day. It's a good day. You look beautiful. Well, thank you. <laughs> Say thank you to that, I guess. Guys, I'm excited to share with you today. I have a word in my heart. We'll get into it in just a moment. Um, I did have something else that I wanted to do at the beginning today. I can't, I can't hardly believe that it's already September, like September 1st today, Labor Day weekend, you made it a church, you hungry for Jesus, come on. Um, I know a lot of us are starting school, right? So we have students and teachers and homeschool families. So I just want to take a moment and pray for all of us that are starting school. Are you guys down to do that? So if you're starting school, can you just stand to your feet? If you're a student, a teacher, if you just work at a school, if you're a homeschool family, come on. Can we just go to them and just bless them? Just really believe that God has a heart for the schools of Springfield. So yeah, if you're next to them, just put your hand on their shoulder. Come on, come on, church. Let's pray a little bit longer. We're praying, church. Yeah. Yeah. Just bless them. Bless that the, the shining face of Jesus would radiate upon them. Conversations about the gospel would just break out in cafeterias and classrooms. Testimonies would flow in dorm rooms. Wisdom from heaven would come and they would learn with grace. That you'd strengthen the teachers, professors, workers with wisdom and character and integrity, Lord. To be planted in this city for this time. To display your glory, your beauty, Lord, in the schools of Springfield. Come on, come on, just a little bit longer. We, we just, right now, if you're tired, if you're even confused, the beginning of school year, you don't know where this is going, you don't know your major, you don't know... Uh, what you're learning right now and what's going to be ahead if you're afraid. I just pray the peace of God upon you, the joy of the Lord upon you, the strength of heaven, the energy to get up and do what you're called to do. Hallelujah. Everybody said amen. 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 Jesus is here. Amen. So excited. Talking about school, young adults just started. I got to pastor that community with my wife who's over there. Young adults started last Tuesday. How many young adults we have in the room? Come on. Woohoo! Let's go. It was beautiful. Tuesday was awesome. We're back here this Tuesday. Today we actually have a picnic after second service. So we're going to eat lunch together. 12.45, 1 o'clock. We're going to meet in the patio in the family center. You're welcome to come. If you're 18 to 30, you're welcome to come. <laughs> we're going to check your ID, okay? <laughs> All right, open with me in Isaiah 61. You have your Bibles. We're going to be in two passages today. We're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus. What's the nature of his ministry? If I'm called a ministry, what does that look like? What's my ministry? How does that play a part? What's the end goal of his ministry? How does it come about? We're going to learn more about that today. We're going to be in two passages, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, and they are speaking about the same theme. Isaiah 61, are you guys there? Isaiah 61. So we have 11 verses. We're going to focus on the first three verses of this prophetic passage. So the whole chapter is a poem. It's a prophetic poem. We're going to focus on the first three verses, but I want you guys to go home and read all of the 11 verses. Will you do that? I need you to do that. But we're going to talk about the first three, okay? All right, so right here, Isaiah, a messianic prophet, is speaking both to his nation, Israel, and to a future people. He's speaking in two timelines. At this time, Israel is oppressed by uh, neighboring kingdoms, and a lot is going on there. Later on, they would go into captivity with Babylon, and Jeremiah comes about. And, and so he's speaking to them about this spirit of God that wants to work with them, to help them. 
And he's speaking to present time, but he's also speaking prophetically into a future time. And we're going to see that here in just, in just a moment. But all of this is happening around 700 years before Jesus came. So Isaiah is speaking roughly 700 years before Jesus came in the flesh. And this is what he's saying. Are you guys there? Isaiah 61. If you're there, say amen. amen. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. First question we got to ask, who is the me here behind? Who is the person behind the me here? Who is, who is the speaker, right? Is this just Isaiah? He's saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That terminology there, anointed, the anointed one, or anointed me, comes from this word in Hebrew, mashak, which is the root word for the word Messiah. So he's saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me. When he's saying that, he's pointing to a Messiah. They would use these terms about the anointing, the mashak, about three different kinds of people in the Old Testament. The priests, the prophets, and the kings. So who is the speaker here? Is he a priest? Is he a prophet? Or is he a king? Yes. <laughs> Option D. All of the above. It's Jesus. Our beloved Jesus. Open with me in Luke 4. We're going to read there really quick and we're going to come back to Isaiah 61. So leave your bookmark right there. So in Luke 4, Jesus is starting his ministry. He went to the Jordan, was baptized in water by his cousin, and the spirit descended upon him like a dove and remained. You guys remember that? So the spirit came and rested upon him. And then the spirit led him into the desert. And he overcame temptation and the enemy. He came out of the desert, and this is where we pick it up. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. The subtitle in my Bible says, Jesus begins his ministry. So he's launching his ministry. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. See, he's in the power of the Spirit. It's different. He was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit rested upon him. And now he over, he come, he's coming with the power of the Spirit. And a report about him went out through all of the surrounding country. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. What's the climate here? Glory. They're glorifying Jesus. He's amazing people. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Can you say, been brought up? In other words, they were familiar with him. They saw him grow up. Right? Maybe some of the people that were around there said, hey, I... You know, he would go to Thanksgiving and say, I saw you grow up. You're so grown. You're so big now. Jesus. Maybe some of the people were the, Jesus, I know him. He played basketball with my son. Not basketball, probably soccer. Just better. <laughs> Whoa. So they knew him. They were familiar with him, right? This is what the Bible is telling us right here. saying they, he had been brought up there. And as was his custom, Jesus had habits. And look at one of his habits right here. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. Imagine this moment. 30 years old, Jesus, starting his ministry, baptized in the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit, gets into the synagogue, and he picks up a scroll to read. All of the eyes are upon him. Here's what he says. 
the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll. That time they didn't have chapters for the books of the Bible. So imagine, it's Isaiah 61. It's down at the bottom. So he's unscrolling that thing. <laughs> he gets to the bottom. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Can we read that out loud? In my Bible, it's red letters. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor. Imagine that moment. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 700 years later, today, I'm inaugurating this scripture. Today, it's starting. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. If you keep going here, here's why they say, they said, is, this, is not this Joseph's son? Everything goes downhill from there. Yeah. I call this the danger of buddy Jesus. Oh, he's my buddy. He can't be. Is he saying he's the Messiah? No, 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 bro. Jesus, you know Jesus, right? The carpenter. Is he saying he's the Messiah? No, no, no. Is this not Joseph's son? They go from amazement to offense. Next thing you know, they're trying to kill him. Just like that. That's the danger of familiarity. Could it be that God has hidden gifts in people around you that you may be too familiar with to recognize? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your neighbors. Familiarity will steal us from the gift of God in the people around us. Somebody said it's good right here. I'll preach to you. <laughs> Familiarity will steal us from the gift of God and people around us. We think he's just our buddy. Listen to me. Jesus is your friend, but he's God. You know what the Bible says? Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. Sometimes people are like, oh, Jesus is my buddy. I'm like, do you fear him? Do you still fear him? All right, let's go back to Isaiah 61. We're going to unpack those three verses. Are you guys with me? Good. Jesus is here. At the end of this service, we're going to open up this altar. I believe Jesus wants to minister. I believe he, you know, when the gospel is proclaimed, Jesus backs it up with power. That's what he does. They would go and preach the message and signs would follow the message. It's not people. It's a person. It's Jesus. He is the gospel. So how does he start this thing? In Isaiah 61, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me. See, the Spirit upon is different than the Spirit within. And I've heard it said before that the Spirit upon is for people's sake and the Spirit within is for my sake. But the Spirit upon, I have to be aware that I'm hosting someone. That's why the Bible says that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit upon us. We're walking with a person. And so he's saying, why, why is this spirit resting upon me? Why is the spirit resting upon you as you go to school and as you go to teach kids? Why? Well, to perform a ministry. And then he describes seven acts of ministry. So the spirit upon you and the anointing upon you is not just so you feel good. It's so that ministry and transformation happens. Wherever you go, you transform the environment. The environment doesn't transform you. You transform the environment. 
You're not just going to conform to your class, but you're going to change your class. That's the ministry of Jesus. Wherever he went, he said, right now, the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's a hand. What does that mean? It's within reach. If you want it, you can touch it. And then he said, why is the spirit of God upon me? Why am I anointed? To bring good news to the poor. Good news. Isn't it a privilege to preach the gospel? There's no other message that will bring good news to those who have ran out of options. There's no other message. That's the gospel. Good news is the same terminology for the gospel. So as Isaiah is pointing to the gospel, right? And then he said, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Pay attention to the people who received the ministry of Jesus. Poor. Brokenhearted. The Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Those who recognize their need for God. A lot of times, we just feel like we're doing okay. So we don't receive. Because all of this starts with receiving. It starts with receiving. That's the way the gospel is set up. You read in John 1, it said that to those who have received him and believed him, he gave the right to become children of God. He is a gift. You start by receiving. We love because he loved us first. So why, why do we try so hard to love? We should just start receiving love. Because when we receive his love, then we love. You know, I used to say this a lot growing uh, as a teenager and coming into the faith. I'm going to be the person that loves Jesus the most, the hardest. And I realized that even in that, there was a lot of pride. Here's who I want to be, the person who is most loved by him. Because if I receive his love the most, then I'm going to love the most. We love because he loved us first. A lot of times we're trying so hard to love, but we need to just open our arms and receive. And we're, we're doing too much and we're too busy trying to earn something that was given for free. And then Jesus is saying, just receive it. Recognize you're poor. Recognize you don't have it all together. Recognize your bank account can fix your problems. Recognize your degree won't fix your problems. Recognize that you can't do it on your own. Open your arms and receive. And if you receive, you're going to know you are a child of God. And you, when you receive, you believe. And when you believe you're a child, that's the gospel. And though Jesus is binding up brokenhearted, I've been brokenhearted. Have you been brokenhearted? Thank God because he heals our heart. To proclaim liberty to the captive. So he's going around and saying, if you're captive, if you cannot set yourself free, I am freedom. That's what he's doing. That's his ministry. We're just talking about Jesus' ministry. Is that all right? He's going on saying, I am freedom. You're running around. You can't fight freedom. I am freedom. You know, the thing with the captive is he can't set himself free. He's locked up. And then he says, he would open up the prison doors to those who are bound. Remember the story of Paul and Silas in prison. They're bound. An earthquake. The doors are open. The guard wakes up. Where's everybody? The doors are open. Paul and Silas are there. Hey, don't worry, we're here, man. You remember that? When you're reading Galatians, the Bible says that it is for freedom that he has set us free. What does that mean? He has opened up the door. Now you have to walk out. He has opened up the door. It is finished. It is done. He has broken up the chains. And now you have to walk out. It's like a bird, right? If you train a bird to stay in the cage, even if the door is open, he may return to the cage. That's why in Galatians 5, when he says that it is for freedom that he has set us free, he says, so do not return to the yoke of slavery. He's saying, don't go back to the cage. You were meant to fly. So he's proclaiming liberty to the captives. If you believe, you walk out. 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can you say the year of the Lord's favor? Now listen, this is a big deal. This is right in the middle here of the ministry uh, description. Why is that a big deal? Jesus ends with that actually when he quotes it in Luke 4. If you read the story of ancient Israel all the way back to Leviticus, Leviticus 25 describes the year of the Lord's favor. The name of that year is Jubilee. How many of you guys have heard of Jubilee? So the seventh year was a big deal in Israel. They would rest the land and a lot of things would take place. And so he's established this thing with his, with his nation that seven times seven, meaning completion times completion, 49 years. On the 50th year, this amazing grace was going to flood the land. And three major things would happen. I'm telling you about Jubilee. The 50th year was Jubilee. And three major things would happen. Here's the first one. Debts would be canceled. Anybody with student loans here? <laughs> Debts would be canceled. Ancient land, ancestral land, would be restored to those who rightly possessed it. It's talking about restoration. It's talking about dreams. It's talking about giving you a place, a descendants, a blessing. The third one, slaves would be set free. That would happen in Jubilee. So here you have Jesus starting his ministry, and he's saying, it's on. I'm launching my ministry. From now on, it is Jubilee in the spirit. Wherever the spirit of God is, that's will be canceled. You'll be restored, and you'll be set free. Is that not amazing? We need to restore this perspective in the power of the gospel. When you announce the gospel, when you preach the good news, when the Spirit of God is upon you, this is the reality you walk in. And he's saying, from now on, it's Jubilee. Hold on, who announces the Jubilee? The high priest. So now you have Jesus announcing Jubilee. Everybody in the synagogue would have known that. And they would have been like, is he saying he's the, right, the high priest? Yes. He is. The high priest would go out with a ram, which Jubilee means a, a ram's horn. And he, he would announce like a shofar with oil and he would say, it's Jubilee in the land. And you have Jesus proclaiming, this is the year of the Lord's favor. It's on. That's amazing. So much in just three verses, right? That's why you got to read all 11 verses later. Because we don't have time for all of it. But you're going to do it, right? Okay, okay. The day of vengeance of our God. That, that terminology there is God was going to be righting wrongs. Bringing justice. Thank God for justice. Amen? To comfort all who mourn. Thank God for comfort. When we have no, nowhere else to turn or no one else to go to, he comes. In the middle of the night, he comes. He keeps our tears in a bottle. They're a prayer to him. To give them a beautiful headdress. Can you say beautiful headdress? Instead. Can you say instead? Now see, Jesus is transforming their circumstance. He's giving them something instead of something. He's exchanging their reality. He does that three times. Pay attention. To give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The all of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. He's transforming their reality. That they may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Those three things that this high priest gives to the people he's ministering to. Or what? A beautiful headdress. That's a turban. Garments of praise, clothing, and the oil of gladness. All of those three things are distinctively pointing to priestly life. So the high priest is saying, when you come to be ministered by me, I'll change your reality and I'll invite you to be a priest. He 
He's saying, in my ministry, you go from recipient to participant just like that. You get to take part. And now you're a priest. As you keep reading Isaiah 61, he would say, you will be called ministers of our Lord, priests of our God. The end goal of this thing is beautiful. At the end of Isaiah 61, he said that righteousness would come, would come upon the earth. And then at the end, the earth would look like a garden. He's saying you are, you are a part of making earth look like Eden again. Because you are priests. We need to get a bigger picture of Jesus' ministry because our ministry fits within his ministry. Have you ever wondered, what's my ministry? Anybody? Come on, let me see your hand. Me too. Me too. There's no such thing as a Christian without a ministry, amen? All of us are called to ministry. So could it be that the places you've been ministered to will, the be, will be the very things that you minister to others? Could it be that what God has done in you that he wants to do through you could it be that when you had ashes and you got oil of gladness, now you're going to go to people who have ashes and you're going to give them gladness? Could it be that because you were oppressed and you were set free, now you're going to go to oppressed people and set them free? Could it be because you were poor and you got good news, now you go to poor people and you're going to share good news? Could that be? It's not complicated, you see? It's not complicated. We start with receiving, but then he said, let me make you a priest. Come participate in what I'm doing. And I'm going to give you my spirit to be upon you, to enable you to do it. Because you could never do it on your own. That's why he said to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem. The spirit will come upon you and he will enable you to be my witnesses. Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. We can never do it on our own. Jesus started to describe his ministry by saying, the power attributed to my ministry is not pointing to this person right here. It's pointing to the spirit that rests upon me. That's why he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, anointed me to do all these things. He's saying, I'm not doing it on my own. That's what he's saying. How could we expect to do the things he called us to do without the spirit? You guys doing okay? <laughs> Jesus is good, amen? amen? Jesus is good. All right. Let's take a look at the recipients of the ministry real quick here. There are poor, brokenhearted. Another word for poor there is oppressed. I've been oppressed. It's not fun. I have been. It's not fun. Poor, oppressed, brokenhearted, captives, blind, those who've been wronged, those who mourn. I feel like I've been all of these. <laughs> Here's the thing. Jesus met me there. If you came into these doors and you're in one of those situations this morning, this could be your morning to be ministered by Jesus, to see him turn it around. If you came in oppressed. When I was 16, Jesus rescued me from great oppression. On the outside, everything looked okay. Partying, had a girlfriend at the time in Brazil, I was playing soccer, I was doing okay in school. All of these things that looked okay for a teenage guy in Brazil. And all I can say is I ran into a wall spiritually. And I felt like there was this blanket of heaviness upon me, which was oppression. There were doors in my life and that thing came in. And I started running everywhere to look for help. And I couldn't find help anywhere down here. I couldn't. I felt like I was a little boat in a stormy sea. And the waves just kept coming. 
And I'd be feeling like at any point another wave is going to hit. So I walked in fear. Another wave is going to come. And I, I was tossed here. And then I was tossed there. And then I was tossed there. And I felt alone. And I felt like I had nowhere to go. You know, when you feel so mentally and emotionally oppressed, it's hard because you don't know where to run to because you're always with yourself. Wherever you go, your mind's there. Right? So I ran out of options. And I remembered the Jesus of my aunt, Sarah. And I called her. I said, pray for me. She said, God's going to meet you there. She preached the gospel to me, the good news. And he started to turn everything around. But there was a point in those years that I was walking in the streets. And I almost fell down because I literally felt drunk in my own thoughts. No substance, just because I could not fight my own mental battles. And I still remember that. It's good to remember where, where Jesus has rescued from. It is. We come in with thanksgiving. I would have been so grateful if he just said, I forgive you. I'll send you to heaven. Or if he had just said, I'll end this for you. I was. I was desperate. But he came to me and he said, I want to restore you. I want to heal you. I want to give you my dreams. I want to make you a priest. I want to bring you into this gospel. And I want to bring you into what I'm doing in the earth. And I want to take you places as an ambassador for my kingdom. What? That's what he wants to do with you. So if you're dealing with any of these things, I'm telling you, don't worry this morning. Just consider yourself a prime candidate to receive his ministry. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. We're going to pray at the end. I want, I want you guys to be open to receive what he wants to do. I believe God has an appointed time with some of you today. And now he makes us priests. You know, the word for priest in the New Testament is this Latin word, pontifex, which in Portuguese, the word pontifex, it's, it's easy to get it because it, it leads to ponte, which is a bridge. But pontifex, it's really pointing to a bridge. So he's saying priests are a bridge. Just think about that for a second. They're meant to come before people on behalf of God and before God on behalf of people. Wherever you go, could it be that the person sitting next to you, the person serving you coffee, the person in your class group to do a project, could it be that you're called to be a bridge between that person and God? If you're a priest, I'd suggest that's the case. This is a room full of bridges. That's the truth. In the New Testament, Peter said, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, if I'm not mistaken, that we are a royal priesthood. Chosen generation, God's people, God's own property. Holy, separated to him. So we walk from here, not just at those who received Jesus' ministry, but those who are willing to participate in his ministry. That's what I see in this room. I want to save some time for us to pray here at the end. I believe God wants to minister to us and really to call some of us to re-sign up for ministry. Some of us have been leaving that. The shelf. God is calling you. Some people think they need a degree or the right network, the night right references. I don't know, a verified social account with the little blue check mark to become a minister. The Bible has a different story. The Bible is saying what you need is the Holy Spirit resting upon you. And that's enough. We could go through, this is Jesus' model of ministry, right? We could, we could go through countless stories. But there's one that comes to mind that I believe is very relevant this morning. 
How many of you guys know the story of the Samaritan woman? She ran out of options, didn't she? She had been through five marriages. She was in, in this place of hopelessness. She's going to this well in the middle of the day so nobody would see her. Who meets her there? Our Jesus. He starts a conversation. Pretty soon, she finds out that he's the Messiah. See, she didn't get healed. If you think about it, she wasn't like blind and then got her sight back. What she got was the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Some of you are like, Diego, I've never been addicted. Do I still have a ministry? Of course you do. You know how people are like, I need a testimony in order to be a minister. All of us have a testimony. If you receive the good news, if you've gotten a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, is that enough? That was enough for the Samaritan woman. And so she got that revelation. She goes from being a receiver to being a participant in the same day. Doesn't she? And she got the revelation. And she didn't just get the revelation that he's the Messiah. But up until that point, she thought, everybody that has really known me didn't love me. But then she met the Messiah. And she realized that he knows everything about her. And he loves her. Most people are afraid to be known because they think that if they're known, they won't be loved. She was fully known and fully loved. She went crazy. <laughs> Come meet the man that knows everything about me. Let me tell you, he actually loves me. All these other guys, they met me. They got to know me. They didn't love me anymore. I met a man who knows everything, everywhere I've been. Diego, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through, the abuse, the trouble, the sin. He knows everything about you. The one that knows you the most loves you the most. That's good news. Is that good news to you? So here's what he said to her. As a matter of fact, if you drink of the water that I give, the water will become in you a river, welling up to eternal life. As a matter of fact, what you're about to receive, you're going to go around and you're going to share with everybody. And it's not just going to be something that you hold with your hands. It's going to flow from inside of you. You won't be able to stop it. That's how Jesus tricked me into ministry. <laughs> Truly, my friends started asking questions and I started saying, I've met a man who knows me the most and he loves me the most. Come meet him. They would come to my house on Friday nights and I'd tell them about the man that I met. I didn't know I was going into ministry. It's just water flowing. You don't want to stop the water. See, it's meant to be a river, not a lake. Why am I not receiving anymore? Are you sharing what you have? It's meant to flow. Stand with me. Let's pray. Come on. Jesus wants to touch many of us this morning. Some of us are like, Diego, I know I've been called to share the gospel and good news, but I've been just disappointed and hopeless. Jesus wants to re-sign you up. He wants to give you oil and a headdress and a garment so you are a priest so you participate some of you are like I've been oppressed I ran everywhere looking for help and I couldn't find it and I still don't have the help I need liberty is here for you today some of you are saying my heart is broken I need healing Jesus is here for you today the other day <laughs> This was wonderful. I was talking to somebody here from our church on the phone. And he's like, I just wanted to tell you, I got healed on a Wednesday night. I said, yeah, what happened? He's like, I was, I was stuck at home for eight months. Couldn't move. My wife went to the healing service. That was like a month ago. I don't know. 
And she prayed for me there that night. I felt different. I woke up the next day and started going around. He came to church Sunday and he's telling everybody, I got healed. I got healed. I got healed. I'm telling you, this is what we need. We need to let the river flow. What has Jesus brought you through? Have you told anybody about it? Can, can we have the ministry team come forward? And Charity can just lead us into a song. And Jesus is here. Can we close your, close your eyes with me? I want to pray over you and we're going to open the altars. this morning this is your morning he's a gift surrender to him some of you just need to receive just receive just open your arms up your hands of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of all right now if you need to receive Jesus today if you need healing, if you need freedom from oppression, all of these things we listed, you know, inside of you, you feel the witness of the Spirit. Come on forward. Don't wait. Just come on forward. They'll pray with you. Let Jesus minister to you through this team right here. And maybe you don't need people right now. You just need to kneel down up here. I just want to welcome you.